All right, thank you, brother. So if you've got your Bibles there, just look at James chapter 5, verse number 14. James chapter 5, verse number 14. It begins by saying, is any sick among you? The title for the sermon tonight is, is, is any sick among you? That's the title for the sermon tonight. And as I've been telling you guys on these Wednesdays, I just want to preach sermons, once again, that I wouldn't n- normally preach, but things that I believe are important as we lead up to uh, your pastor being away for those 12 months. And again, you know, it's my desire to get up here every week. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. It seems like I'm not going to be able to get up here every week until after Christmas by all the news reports that are going ahead with the border being closed in Queensland. And so we will come back to James chapter 5, but I do want to preach about sicknesses, illnesses. These are things that we all suffer with, some more than others. Some have chronic uh, issues that they struggle with. Some of us have lesser things that, that, are, that bother us. But the reality is all of us go through sickness, okay? So this is important for all of us. We will come back to James chapter 5. Please go to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. And as you're turning there, I'm just going to read to you from Galatians 3.13. Just as a reminder, I have covered this recently. It says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. And of course, when we look at that passage, we often think about the fact that Jesus took on all our sins. All the, all the iniquities that we have done uh, from the first man, Adam, to the very last man to live on the earth. You know, God, Jesus Christ, took the sins of everybody. He became the curse for us. But look at Matthew chapter 8 here, verse number 16. Matthew chapter 8, verse number 16, it says, When the even was come, they brought unto him, that's unto Jesus, many that were possessed with devils, And he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. So yes, Jesus was in in the business of saving souls. And he was in the business of casting out devils. But he was also in the business of healing the sick when he walked this earth. Look at verse number 17. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. And so when Jesus became a curse for us, not only did he take on our sin, the punishment for our sins, but even our sicknesses, our infirmities were put on Jesus. What do we learn from that then? If Jesus became the curse for us, that the reason we get sick is because that's part of the curse. That's part of the sin, uh, this sin-cursed earth that we live in, this, these sin-cursed bodies that we live with, right? These corrupted bodies. The reason you get sick, brethren, is because we live in a cursed world. And you know, not only did Jesus die for your sins, he also died for your sicknesses. He paid for all of the, all of the consequences that come with the curse that fell upon this earth. Okay? That's important for us to remember. Jesus, Jesus is familiar with our sicknesses. All right? Why do we get sick? Because we, are, we live in a sin-cursed world. That's why. Okay? Number one. That's point number one. We live in a sin-cursed world. Now, please go to John chapter 9. John chapter 9. We are going to jump around the Bible quite a lot tonight, okay? John chapter 9. Now, just because I said, you know, the reason we get sick is because we live in a sin-cursed world. I don't want you to have the idea then that just because someone does get sick, it's because they committed a sin and Jesus, you know, God is just judging that person. You know, you wake up one morning with a cold. All right, oh, I know why you've got a cold, brother, because you've sinned against the Lord. You did something wicked today, right? You need to get right with the Lord and fix that up. Now, look, we probably need to get right with the Lord anyway, because we sin every day, okay? But, you know, we shouldn't just conclude because we have sicknesses, that means we've sinned against the Lord. And so we have a great story here in John chapter 9, verse 1, that explains this. It says here, John chapter 9, verse 1, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. So that's a serious illness, right? A serious uh, corruption, uh, uh, defect that he has. He's blind from birth. Verse number 2, And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? All right? So this is the, you know, the prosperity gospel. This is the, this is the, uh, the idea of the Pentecostals. They believe that you should never get sick, that you should never uh, uh, be poor. You know, if, if, if you're a Christian, they believe all of us deserve to be uh, wealthy and without sicknesses. And if you, are, if you do have any of these issues, it's your lack of faith. It's your sin against the Lord. Now, look, the question gets asked, you know, who sinned? Was it this man or was it his parents? Number, verse number three, Jesus, Jesus answered, Neither have this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Now, what do we learn here? That 
just because you're sick, it doesn't mean you're sick because it's a consequence of sin. As I said, we get sicknesses because we live in a sin-cursed world. Okay, You can't expect your body to live an entire 70, 80, 100 years of life and never get sick. It, it cannot happen. Just like you cannot expect yourself to go your entire life without sinning, you can't expect yourself to go your entire life without sicknesses. You're going to get something, brethren. It's going to happen, right? And uh, look at verse number four. I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh, when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and said unto him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed, and came seen. Now, I do like what Jesus said there in verse number four, I must work the works of him that sent me. Okay? So, you know, healing the sick wasn't some side thing. It wasn't some plan B, plan C, you know, as he's walking the earth, oh, I guess I'll heal you. No, it was, it was part of the work that God the Father sent Jesus to do was also to heal the sick, okay? Let's keep that in mind, that Jesus is in the business of healing. And, you know, I want you to be careful. I want you to be mindful as I'm preaching through this because I don't want you, as I'm going through this, I don't want you, and I know some of you came from the charismatic background, okay, the faith healers, you know, Put your hands on the television screen and you'll be healed from cancer. Look, uh, that's not what I'm preaching about today, okay? We're going to take the Bible. We're going to see what we see here. We're going to take the, the learnings and understand how is this applicable for us today in 2020, okay? And as I said, there's a reason why I want to preach this before I leave because I think this is very important, okay? And so, of course, this blind man did not sin. And, and the, probably the greatest example of somebody who suffered great sickness, great illness, Without, you know, because, you know uh, was, was Job, right? Job, right? He suffered greatly. He had a physical sickness as well as losing all his possessions. But the Bible tells us, the Holy Spirit tells us that Job was a perfect and upright man. Hey, even a perfect and upright man can suffer from sicknesses, okay? And so sometimes the Lord will just allow us to go through some difficulty to test us, to try us, to make us, uh, to, to refine us, you know, and, and make us even better, you know, as Christians. And so, you know, when you get sick, think about, well, what is it here? You know, just like any trial, what is it that uh, God can use in my life? What is, it, what is it that He's trying to refine in my life? And it potentially, it's just a matter of you going to the Lord and asking Him for help. That might be the reason you have a sickness, to draw you closer to Him. Now, please go to Second Chronicles. This is an important story. I really want everyone to turn here, okay? Second Chronicles chapter 2. Second Chronicles Oh, sorry, chapter 14. 2 Chronicles, chapter 14. And we're going to be looking at the story of King Asa. You know, you can read about his story in 2 Chronicles 14, 15, 16. The Bible covers his life quite a lot. He's a great man of God, okay? But just like many of the kings, he starts off so well. I'm so excited when I read his story. And then I'm kind of saddened at the end how it all ends, Okay? Let's have a look at this. 2 Chronicles 14, verse 1. It says, So Abijah slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David, and Asa, so that's the king we're going to be looking at, and Asa, his son, reigned in his stead. In his days the land was quiet ten years. So there's like peace, you know, he's a great king. There's peace in the land for ten years. Verse number two. And Asa did that which was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. What did he do? Look at verse number three. For he took away the altars of the strange gods and the high places and break down the images and cut down the groves and commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers and to do the law and the commandments. Hey, it's a great king, right? He says, look, we've got to clean up the land. Let's get rid of these false gods, these statues. Get rid of them. We're going back to worship the one true God. Praise God for a king like that. Okay. And of course, you know, as the leader of this nation, because of his heart toward God, they were able to have then 10 years of peace. All right? Let's go to chapter 16 now. You know, let's, let's fast forward toward the end of his life. Second Chronicles 16. And like I said, you can read his story. A great man of God did many, many great works, okay? Second Chronicles 16. But we're fast forwarding now toward the end of his life. And let's learn about what, let's see what we can learn here. Second Chronicles 16 verse 1. 
And don't forget, this is a time period where the nation of Israel has divided into its two kingdoms. The southern kingdom of Judah, the northern kingdom retained the name of Israel. Okay? And sometimes these two kingdoms would be at war. They would not like each other many times, right? There was, there was issues. And this is one situation where the northern kingdom of Israel desires to make war against the Jews in Judah. 2 Chronicles 16 verse 1, it says, In the sixth and thirtieth year of the reign of Asa, Baasha, king of Israel, came up against Judah and built Ramah to the intent that he might let none go out or come into Asa, king of Judah. What's happening here? This guy puts a border, border control. You know, he stops people from his kingdom from coming into the southern kingdom. Okay, because the southern kingdom was being blessed by God and the northern kingdom was, was wicked. People were leaving the northern kingdom to migrate to the southern kingdom and, and the king here of Israel wanted to put a stop to it. Okay, just like, you know, just like our Queensland Premier has put a stop to people from New South Wales from coming across. The same thing is going on, right? And uh, look, look at verse number uh, two. It says here, Then Asa brought out silver and gold out of the treasures of the house of the Lord. That's strange. So he takes all the, 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 the rich items, the, the gold, right, the silver, out of the house of God. He was so instrumental in getting this nation back serving the Lord. He now takes the riches of the house of the Lord. And what does he do with it? And of the king's house, and sent to Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, that dwelt at Damascus, saying. So he goes to the king of Syria. He says, look, I need your help. The northern king, he doesn't like me. We're probably going to go to war. So he takes the riches of the, ter- of the house of God and gives it to this other king, right? He tries to make an allegiance so that way that they're stronger militarily in case the northern kingdom attacks. Look at verse number two. Uh, sorry, verse number three. And he says, uh, There is a league between me and thee, as there was between my father and thy father. Behold, I have sent thee silver and gold. Go, break thy league with Baasha, king of Israel, that he may depart from me. Okay, let's drop down to verse number seven. Now, should he have done that? Should he have taken the possessions of the house of God and give it to a Gentile king? No, he shouldn't have done that. What should he have he done? If he was concerned for the welfare of his nation, should he have gone to another king? No, he should have gone to the Lord God. I mean, the Lord's already been blessing him for so many years, you know, in Israel. But, you know, this is, we, we soon see that this is a pattern. At the end of King Asa's life, he does not go to the Lord. He does not rely on the Lord. Verse number 7. And at that time, Han, 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 Hanani, the seer, so seer is another way of saying prophet, came to Asa, king of Judah, and said unto him, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria, and not relied on the Lord thy God, therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims a, a huge host with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thine hand. So the, the prophets reminded him, look, when you relied on God, he helped you in warfare. Why didn't you go to him this time? Okay, look at verse number nine. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly, Therefore, from henceforth, thou shalt have wars. Okay? So let's think about this. The prophet's saying, because you did not go to God first, you've done foolishly. Okay? We're going to tie this in to sicknesses, to illnesses. Okay? That's a topic. And let me say to you, brethren, if you're sick, if, you're, if you have an illness, what's the first port of call? Who should you go to first? The Lord God. Okay? The Lord God first. And when you fail to do this, you have done foolishly. Okay? Let's keep going. You'll see how it ties in very soon to sicknesses. Sorry, Brendan, where am I up to? Verse number 10. Then Asa was wroth with the seer, so he's angry at the prophet, and put him in a prison house. Oh, this is the guy that was serving the Lord. He was faithful to God. Now he takes God's preacher, puts him in jail, right? For he was in a rage with him because of this thing. And Asa oppressed some of the people at the same time. And behold, the acts of Asa, first and last, lo, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. Now notice verse number 12, this is important. And Asa, in the 30th and 9th year of his reign, was diseased in his feet. Hey, so he gets a sickness. 
He gets some type of foot disease, some type of problem, right? And look at this. Until his disease was exceeding great, yet in his disease he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. That's interesting. So King Asa, he's sick, okay? Instead of going to God, God, can you help me in this situation? He went to his physicians. He went to his doctors, okay? Now, is this saying that it's ever wrong to go to the doctors? Is it ever wrong to go to the physician? No. But what it's telling us is he didn't go to God, right? Look at verse number 13. What happens to him? And Asa slept with his fathers and died in the one and fortieth year of his reign. So he dies. He dies from this foot disease. Now, the Bible is very clear there in verse number 12 that he did not go to God. You know why that's there? It's, it's there because it's telling us if he went to God, it would have been sorted. God would have taken care of the situation. So it, it tells us, it emphasizes, the Holy Spirit is telling us he did not go to God. He just went to the physicians. Therefore, he passed away. He died. Okay? He did foolishly, right? Just like when he was, uh, uh, you know, uh, worried about the northern kingdom. Okay, he did not seek the Lord. He went to the king of Syria, failed. And just like when he got this foot disease, he did not go to God. He went to the physicians, failed. Okay, he failed both times there. Look at verse number 14. And they buried him in his own sepulchres, which he had made for himself in the city of David, and laid him in the bed, which was filled with sweet odors and diverse kinds of spices prepared by the apostles apothecary's art and they made a very great burning for him and so look they do recognize him it's not like he he it's not like he's this great you know like he's not this wicked king all right he was, he was a good king but he really messed up toward the end of his life he started to lose the faith that god will step in and deliver him you know whether that's out of war or whether that's out of you know sicknesses and so the bible's quite clear he went to the physicians but he did not go to god okay and so what's the lesson there brethren when you get sick Okay, and I know your first thought is call the emergency. Okay, well, actually, yeah, do call the emergency, but the emergency in heaven, call there first, right? When, when, when you get sick, oh, I've got to make, make an appointment with the doctor. No, the first thing you do is you go to God, say, God, I've got this sickness, please help me. And then you go to the physician. Okay, I'm not saying never go to the physician because even Jesus says, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick, okay? So Jesus is not against physicians, all right? But hey, when you're sick, yeah, you need a physician. But before you go to the physician, go to God. Ask Him for help. And if you don't do it, you're doing foolishly, brethren, all right? Remember, sick, sickness is a result of the curse, okay? A sin-cursed world. And so this is something God can help us with. Of course, when Jesus says about not needing a physician, he's talking about in a spiritual sense, all right? Obviously, a sinner needs Jesus. If you're lost, you need Jesus. He is the, the great physician, is he not, okay? But the fact that he uses the illustration of the physician is, is, is obviously him supporting, you know, the idea that, yeah, if you need a physician, you go to the physician. But don't forget, you go to God first. That's a lesson that we can learn from King Asa. Now, please turn to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. Because what I want to tell you, brethren, is that if you're suffering from sickness, that this is something that God wants you to go to Him about, okay? And on Wednesday nights, guess what we do after the preaching? We have a time of prayer, okay? And we normally get people to submit their requests. And I know there's a lot more sick people out there, but those prayer requests are not coming through. And I wonder why. And so I think, well, I need to preach this then, right? Reminding ourselves that we need to go to the Lord in prayer first, Okay, he's the one, he, he can do, he, he's the one that can perform a miracle, right? He's the one that can stop the sickness immediately if he so desires. Luke chapter 7 verse 1. Because the thought there is, well, you know, Jesus was walking the earth 2,000 years ago, Pastor Kevin. You know, yeah, he was walking, he was healing the sick. I mean, he was, you know, stopping the storms, right? He was calming the seas. He was casting out, the, he was doing amazing, he was raising the dead, Pastor Kevin. Well, you think we, we can still do that today? Well, you know what? We don't need Jesus physically here to heal the sick, okay? Jesus is God. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere, okay? We can just ask in His name and He'll hear our prayers. Luke chapter 7 verse 1, it says here, Now when He had ended all His sayings in the audience of the people, He entered into Capernaum, that's Jesus of course, and a certain centurion, serv centurion servant who was dear unto Him was sick and ready to die. 
And when he had heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servants. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. So the centurion wants his servant to be healed, okay? You can see immediately this is a good man, a good centurion. He's a powerful man, okay? He has power in the Roman Empire. Hey, but he cares for his servants. That's a good man, okay? And one of his servants is sick. He goes, look, can you get Jesus? Call Jesus. We need Jesus to heal my servant. Verse number six. Then Jesus went with them. And when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself. For I am not worthy that thou, that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee. But say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. Listen, the centurion knew that Jesus did not have to be physically there. He says, Jesus, you just say the word, and my servant will be healed. Brethren, do you have that faith? When you're struggling with sicknesses, do you have that faith when you bring that request before God? And you say, you know what, Jesus? You know what, God? If you just say the word, I know I can be better. I know my family member can be better. If you just say the word, you don't even have to be here like you were walking 2,000 years ago on this earth. Okay? You don't need to even be under my house. And I know that you can heal this person if you so will. Do you have that faith? Verse number 8. For I am a man set under authority having under me soldiers, and I say unto one, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he do it. You know what he's saying? He says, Look, I'm under authority, but I also have authority. If I tell my servants, Go over there, they'll do it. You know what he's saying to Jesus? He goes, I know you have authority. I know you have authority over sicknesses. Okay? And if you want that sickness gone, it'll happen. That's what he's saying. I understand you have ultimate authority, Jesus. And this is a man of great faith, right? Verse number 9, when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned him about and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And they, and they that were sent to return to the house found the servant whole that had been sick. Wow, Jesus did not even have to be there, okay? Jesus saw the faith of the centurion man and said, you know what, that faith is so great, I'm just going to answer that prayer. You know what? That man believes in me. That man believes I have authority to do this. He's a man of great faith. The servant was healed. Brethren, this is no different to us today. Jesus is not walking, walking this earth right now in this physical form, I understand that. But look, we can bring our request before Jesus. We can ask him and tell him, look, God, you've got authority over all these things. You know, can you make me better? Can you make my family member better? You know, let's, let's come. What is the church? It's the body of Christ. You know, we come to church, we pray for one another, we bring our prayer requests here, we pray for those things. Hey, it's just like as if we've gone to Jesus and asked him to help us, just like the centurion man. Amen. Sicknesses, sicknesses, you know. Can God heal today? Absolutely, absolutely, okay? He can. Now, if you can please turn, I'll get you to turn to James, let's go to James chapter 5 now. James chapter 5. So I'm just building on here right now. I just want you to see that, you know, God is in the business of healing. So you're going to James chapter 5. And while you're turning to James chapter 5, I'm going to read to you from 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now, this is a dangerous chapter to read from, okay? In, you know, in, in the Baptist realm, okay? Because the Baptists are always afraid all right? Oh, someone's going to think of me as a Pentecostal. They're going to think of me as a Baptocostal if I preach this. Listen, it's, it's in Corinthians. It's a letter to a church, a New Testament church. Look, and I, I, I've, taught this, I've taught through Corinthians before, okay? So if you want my thoughts around this, you can go back. But I just want to bring your attention to one part of it here in 1 Corinthians 12, 27. It says, Now ye are the body of Christ, okay? Speaking of the church, and members in particular, Okay? Now, of course, this is a first century church. We had the apostles. We had these, these men doing great miracles that we read about in the Bible. right? And then it says this in verse number 28. Speaking about the church. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondary prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, 
Now notice the next one. It says, then gifts of healings. Gifts of healings. Helps, governments, diversities of tongues. And we know that, you know, speaking a tongue, speaking another, another tongue, another language, was something supernatural that God gave to people who could not speak that language before, right? And so when we look at a passage like this, you know, I look at this and I say, well, look, we still have diversities of tongues, don't we? I mean, how, how many of you speak a second language, can speak another language besides English? Can I just say a show of hands? One, two, I can, three, my wife is not here, but she can speak Portuguese. Look, our church already has a diversity of tongues, all right? So when we look at this and we know that God gave the gift of tongues for preaching the gospel, well, you know what, if we have a diversity of tongues, we need to see how is God going to use us to preach the gospel in these languages that we've learned. You know, think about how can we do this? Because it is a gift that God gave. And look, I've not seen today somebody just being able to speak from, from nowhere. But the fact is, we do speak other languages and let's use it. Let's use our languages to preach the gospel to those that understand those languages. There's nothing wrong with taking the principle and applying it today, right? But one thing we notice here is the first century church to help this church be established, some had the gifts of healings. Do you believe you have the gift of healing, Pastor Kevin? No. Okay. I don't believe I have that gift. Okay. I mean, I'm not like the Apostle Paul or, you know, uh, a Peter that can just raise someone from the dead. Okay. I'm not somebody that can just make a lame person uh, to walk. I don't have that gift that we read about there in the Bible. Okay. But there's a principle, is there not? There's a principle that within the church, if someone needs healing, if someone has a sickness, the church is a place that they can come and seek that healing. That principle is there. Just like the diversity of tongues, the principle is there. If you can speak another language, hey, use the language and preach the gospel and reach people that speak another language. Okay? The principle is there. Now the question is, well, how do we apply this today? You know, Pastor Kevin, if you're, you don't have the gift of healings, what do we do? Well, this is why James chapter 5 is here for us, okay? And I know there are some preachers that say, well, the book of James, that's for the Jews, all right? The unsaved Jews that go into the uh, tribulation period, right? They don't get raptured in the pre-trib rapture. They'll say that they'll go into the tribulation. This is just for them. Is it really? Because the church is mentioned in this chapter, okay? Let's have a look at it. James chapter 5, verse 14. What do we learn? And look, I've spoken to other pastors about this, but I've never really heard anyone preach on this, okay? And I don't know, is, is it that Baptists are shy to preach the Bible? I've never heard of Baptists being shy to preach the Bible. It's right here, okay? Everything that I'm showing you is biblical, right? James chapter 5, verse 14. Is any sick among you? Brethren, answer the question yourself, to yourself. Is any sick among you? There is someone sick here, then this is for you, okay? It says here, let him call for the elders of the church. Who's the elder of the church? That's me, okay? This is your instruction. This is what I want you to be left with. Why are you preaching this, Pastor Kevin? Because in a month, I'm not going to be here, okay? And I don't know when I'll be able to cross the border once again, all right? If there's any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. Now, look. I know there are sick people in this church, okay? I'm not just going to go to you and say, hey, let's do James chapter 5. It says here that you are to call the elders, Amen. okay? You call the elders of the church. And look at this, and let them pray over you, oh, sorry, over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Oh, this sounds like Benny Hinn, Pastor Kevin. No, it doesn't. I was watching Benny Hinn just this afternoon on YouTube, <laughs> all right? He was getting the people up on the, on the stage, they, I never saw them put oil on them, right? Look, what's it say there? Yeah, anointing with, I don't remember any oil. Do you remember oil, Brethren? <laughs> Penny in walking around with oil, anointing me with oil and praying. Hey, did you see them calling the elders or the elders calling them? This is, you know what Benny Hinn does? That, you know, these, these crazy guys on TV, they're not following James chapter 5, okay? Yes, you know, there are weirdos out there. There are people that take the Bible and abuse the passages and fool the simple-minded, Hey, but just because there are people like that, we shouldn't be afraid of what the Bible just clearly says. Okay? What it clearly teaches. Are we Bible-believing Christians or are we not? All right? This is what the Bible says. What happens? Verse number 15. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Who's praying? 
the elders are praying, right? If you look back there, it says, and let them, that's the elders, pray over him. So listen, you know, if I'm being called for something like this, I'm taking this very seriously. I need to be full of faith, you know? And I have done this before, and I've just made sure I fasted on the day, okay? Because fasting, like, like I've taught before, helps you, you know, not give in to the fleshly desires, but to focus on spiritual matters, you know, you need your faith increased. And so that's what I would rather do. You know, if I have the time to do this, you know, fast as well. It says, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the Lord shall raise him up. This is, brethren, this is a guarantee. Isn't that what it says? And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. What do we learn here? Like at the beginning, we learned that just because you're sick, it doesn't mean you're sick because you've sinned. Okay. But this passage, is, passage tells us that it can be. You know, God can punish you with sickness because of sins. And this process, if you are someone that has sinned against the Lord, and the Lord has given you this sickness for whatever reason, allowed you as a punishment for your sins, that those sins that caused the sickness, that they will be forgiven as well through this process. Okay? Because look, we don't always remember our sins, do we? When we? You know, when we go and confess our sins before the Lord, we probably just remember the major ones. We don't really remember maybe the minor ones that we went through the day, right? And so there are always sins that we haven't necessarily confessed before the Lord. This is why I, I, when I confess my sins to the Lord, I just name the ones I remember and I say, Lord, if there's anything else, can you please take care of them as well? Because I don't know, I can't remember, you know, right? All the sins that we struggle with in our life. But listen, you'll be saved, you'll be raised up. And if there's any sins that you've committed, and that's the reason why you got sick, they, those sins will be forgiven him. Well, I mean, this is positive, this is good. I don't know why this is not practiced more often. I don't get it. It's positive, right? Now look, I, I kind of understand because when I was, you know, confronted with this passage, I was like, man, what do I do? Because I, I have seen other pastors do this, but, you know, it's not really taught, like I said, it's not really, because people are afraid to be lumped in with the Pentecostals, you know, the Charismatics, with Benny Hinn's of this earth, you know? We're Bible-believing Christians. I'll give you two examples. And I give you these examples not to boast of myself because I am nothing, brethren. I, I, I am nothing, right? I'm boasting of Christ, okay? Our faith in Him, His ability to heal, right? And I remember, uh, you know, a man, you know, uh, and I won't, I, won't, I won't name the names, but just a man struggling with, with chronic stomach issues. And I didn't know about the, these issues. He never told me about it, right? So he, he went months, month after month, after, I don't know, what, four or five months, with just chronic stomach issues, right? Having to go to the toilet and, uh, you know, just not feeling good, right? And I heard about it. He told me about it, and he, wa he wanted to go uh, look for treatment in another country, you know, potentially go to Asia somewhere and get some treatment there. And I just said to him, look, just read James chapter 5 and tell me what you think. You know, if you want me to come, let's do this. So it's there. Might as well before you go to Asia, <laughs> right? <laughs> before you go somewhere else. So sure, surely enough, you know, he read it. He goes, yeah, let's do it, all right? Now, I, I didn't have the time to fast this time, you know, but I did get one other man to come and, because it says elders. Now, there's only one elder, but, you know, I think it's probably a good idea, if, if possible, to get somebody else who is maturity, who has, you know, spiritual maturity. We prayed over him, anointed him with oil, right? And, uh, and then I, next day, I didn't really reach out to him, but then, like, two days later, I just said, hey, you know, how you, how's it going? You know, like, and, and here's the thing, when I, pr when I did this, brethren, and I prayed over him, I'm like, Lord, I don't know if I have the faith. All I know is this is in the Bible, <laughs> okay? These are your words, and Lord, I'm holding you accountable to your words. I know, you're, I know you are true to your words, and I have faith that you are true to your words, even though I sometimes lack in faith. That's how I prayed, basically. And Lord, if it's your will, as we see here, please heal this man. We anoint him with oil, right? Two days later, I ring him up. Yeah, I'm good. I'm healed. I'm like, no way can't be. <laughs> I'll, I'll give him another couple of days, then I'll ring him again. I'll see how he's going. Because, right? like, I, I'm thinking best case scenario, maybe it feels a little bit better. Worst case scenario is about the same, like, I'm just thinking, right? A couple of days later, I ring him up again, or, mess, or text him, or whatever, text him. Yeah, he goes, like, yeah, I, I'm, I told you, I'm better. I'm like, it can't be, right? <laughs> so I thought, I, I'll give him another week. Let's see how it goes in a week. Because, I mean, literally, this guy had issues every day for several months, all right? A week later, I ring him, he says, look, he, it's, like, uh, it's almost like he was asking, why are you asking me? Like, don't you have the faith, Pastor Kevin? <laughs> You're meant to be the praying with faith, right? And he's like, no, it's, it's gone. All right? And I said, well, how, was, it, was it immediate? As soon as we did it, he goes, no, no, 24 hours later. 
So e even after we prayed with him, he still had stomach issues, but 24 hours later, it was gone. I mean, is that a miracle, brethren? That's a miracle. Can God heal? Yeah, he can. Recently, another chronic issue, okay, um, did the same thing. Again, no instant results, okay, it's not like an immediate thing that's happened, okay, and it's not completely gone, but significant difference, significant. I mean, from going, again, a daily thing, multiple times a day, to like, what is it, half a week or something now, without it being an issue, or more, I don't know, okay. Can God heal? Yes. Do we have faith in James chapter 5, though? We should. It's there. All right? This is to the, written to the church. All right? And it's not, oh, man, Pastor Kevin, can you take off your coat and pour, put it on me because I need to get better? I need to be healed? No, we, we just do what the Bible says. That's all we can do, right? Just have, have faith in the Word of God and do it. Now, look, you know, when I first heard about, you know, this one individual feeling better and being healed, I just thought it was the placebo effect kind of thing. You know? Have you guys heard of the placebo effect? I think this happens in the Benny Hinn situations where someone's got a pain in his leg, they pray over, they push him over even, and it's like his leg's healed, he doesn't feel any more pain. Two weeks later, he's back in his wheelchair or whatever. There is, a, there is something called the placebo effect where, you know, you feel like you've been better, you know, you, you've, you've received a positive message, you know, uh, you have an expectation that you're going to be healed, you know, and, uh, you know, I've, like I suffer from asthma, I've had people take asthma sprays without any drug inside of it, and there's nothing there, it's just air, but they take it and they feel better. It's a placebo effect, because there's an expectation that it's going to help them with their asthma. And that's what I thought it was, a little bit. You know, I'm just being honest with you. But no, you know, after, a, it, it's gone, okay? This man was healed. And this other individual's feeling much, much better, all right? So, look, it's, it's there. Now, I think the reason some people don't do this, or don't ask the pastor, is because it, the question is, well, what if it doesn't work? Okay? What if it doesn't work? Well, first of all, that's a bad attitude to go into with this, okay? Because it's a prayer of faith, and it's just there, the Lord will raise him up, right? The, f the prayer of faith shall save the sick, okay? But there is the possibility, yes, of course, that he doesn't get any better or whatever. I guess that possibility is there, okay? Now, let's take our Bibles and turn to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. So, brethren, as I said, I'm going to be here for another, what is it, five weeks. Okay, it's just over a month. All right? And I, I'm just saying, you know, I'm not, look, I'm not going to come to you and tell you, let's do this. I'm just saying, look, let's pay attention. It's there in the Bible. If someone's sick, let's deal with it now. Because I don't know when I'll be able to get back. All right? This is why I wanted to preach this tonight. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23. Now, the concern is, well, what if God doesn't heal me? And does that mean I'm a bad Christian? Actually, it means I'm, I'm probably, I didn't have that much faith because it's, it's a prayer of faith that will help that person. But remember, Timothy is a pastor, all right, being used greatly by God. And we see that, look, Timothy, like even great men of God could not shake off sicknesses sometimes, okay? 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23 says, drink, this is Paul instructing Timothy, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake, and thine often infirmities. Often infirmities. Listen, Timothy had, an, had a chronic issue with his stomach. No different to that man that I spoke to you about, okay? A, a chronic issue with his stomach. And look, you know, we see this in James chapter 5. And, and this, is, this is a period where there are apostles walking the earth doing amazing miracles. And yet somehow Timothy is still struggling with sickness. So look, if we do James chapter 5 and you remain sick, Okay, first of all, we shouldn't expect that. But if it happens, it, you're numbered amongst other great people. Okay, there can be other reasons that God leaves sicknesses with us. Okay, and only God knows those purposes. He knows those reasons. When we go to heaven, we can ask him, why was that there? Okay, but what we see here, the instruction is drink a little wine for your stomach's sake, right? Instead of water all the time. Now, this is where some, you know, the drunkos, you know, they turn to this, well, see, you know, pastors are allowed to drink wine. Praise God, alcoholic wine. You know what, just to combat that very quickly, I just did a quick search. I just wanted to see what are the health benefits of alcohol. Let's say this was alcoholic wine for a moment. Okay, what are the health benefits? Let's look at it. I went to uh, mayoclinic.org. 
And here are the benefits, the so-called benefits. It says uh, it reduces or uh, reducing your risk of developing and dying of heart disease. Oh, that sounds good, heart disease, right? Possi possibly reducing your risk of ischemic stroke. Okay, so it can help the heart, can help the brain, I guess. Possibly re reducing your risk of diabetes. Possibly reducing your risk of diabe diabetes. What does that have to do? What does any of these things have to do with a chronic stomach problem? Is that what Paul is telling Timothy? Drink a little wine so you don't take a, have a stroke anymore? <laughs> is that what's going on? But here's, it keeps going, right? So I read the benefits. And listen, anything has benefits, pretty much, right? But then it says this in the article. However, so these are the benefits. However, eating a healthy diet and being physically active have much greater health benefits. Much greater than drinking the alcohol, right? And have been more extensively studied, okay? So look, listen, if Paul was saying to Timothy, drink a little bit of alcohol, he would have been better off just saying, look, just eat well and get some exercise. That would have been better for Timothy than if it had been alcoholic, you know, beverage, right? And then it says this in the article. It says, keep in mind that even moderate, so this is a small amount of alcohol, use isn't risk-free. For example, even light drinkers, even light drinkers, right? Just, just a cup with my, with my meal, just a cup of wine, right? Those who have more than one drink a day have a tiny but real increased risk of some cancers. Do you think Paul's telling Timothy, drink a little alcohol, help your tummy, but hey, you might get cancer. That doesn't seem right. <laughs> right? Now look, so what do we learn here? We learn that listen, there is a time, yes, you know, to get some treatment, you know, to seek some advice, seek some counsel, take something else for your sicknesses. Yes, there's a place for that, okay? I'm not saying all we do is James chapter 5. No, there's a time for physician. There's a time for other things that can help you, right? But the point of this sermon is that we need to go to God first, all right? Now, regarding alcohol, I looked at the risks. What are the risks, okay? Here are the risks of, of alcohol. That it can cause certain cancers, including breast cancer and cancers of the mouth, throat, esophagus, and liver. Pancreatitis. Sudden death if you already have cardiovascular disease. Heart muscle damage leading to heart failure. Stroke. High blood pressure. Liver disease. Suicide. Accidental serious injury or death. Brain damage and other problems in an unborn child. Alcohol withdrawal syndrome. Do you think... Paul's going to Timothy, have a little bit of alcohol and risk your liver, you know, <laughs> risk getting addicted to this substance, risk a high blood pressure, risk getting a stroke. No, the little wine mentioned here is obviously not alcohol, it's grape juice, okay, it's grape juice. And so I looked up grape juice, grape juice and I looked at some benefits of it, I'll just go through them very quickly, grape juice, non-alcoholic grape juice, uh, prevents cancer, controls diabetes, treats acidity, Hey, that could be something to tie in with the stomach there, okay? Fights cold, aids in weight loss, promotes digestion. Hey, that's got to do with the stomach, right? Uh, having a little bit of wine for the stomach's sake, okay? It says here, it improves digest digestion by increasing the flow of gastric juices. So it's the fiber contents in the grapes. It treats athero atherosclerosis, I don't know what that is, I can't pronounce it, boosts energy, maintains cholesterol, improves immunity, promotes heart health, relieves headaches, this is just grape juice, non-alcoholic grape juice, strengthens bones, prevents signs of aging, improves hair growth. So when you look, compare these two things, brethren, which one do you think the Apostle Paul is telling Timothy to take? Grape juice, <laughs> it's grape juice, all right, that, that's helping him. Now, can you please go to 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 12? 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And the reason I just went through that, brethren, is just to show you, yes, there's a time and place for treatment, okay? That's fine, okay? It's fine to go to the physician. It's fine to do these things. But first point of call is to go to your church, okay? Go to God. Go to the body of Christ. Go to the pastor and ask him, can, you, can we do James chapter 5? Can we do this prayer for my sickness? That would be the first point of call. Okay, I'm not talking about an emergency situation. You've gone into a car accident, you know, you know, your, your, your heart's diminishing, and like, we've got to rush into emergency. No, I've got to take it to Pastor Kevin first. No, just go to emergency, all right? <laughs> I'll meet you in the hospital later on. It's all right, okay? 
I'm not talking about that situation. I'm just talking about the fact, that, just like Timothy, right? Chronic issues that he had in his health. Just like King Asa, you know, fit, uh, foot disease that got gradually worse and worse and worse, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 12, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 7. Not only did Timothy struggle with some chronic stomach issues, but we learn about this with Paul. He says, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So Paul knows why he's suffering with a thorn in the flesh. He knows why he has a sickness. He says, it's so I don't get exalted above measure. He says, Paul says, look, I, I have a pride issue. I have a pride issue. And so God sent this to me so I don't have to, so I don't exalt myself. It keeps me humble. It keeps me needing God. Okay? So there's a, these are, there can be a reason for sickness. Paul, why didn't you go to the elder? Why didn't you do James chapter 5 and get healed? You know what? God had a reason for that sickness. Okay? Let's keep going. Verse number 8. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, three times, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will, will I rather, look at this, glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So he says, look, I'm sick. Here's the first port of call. I'm going to God. God, can you take care of this? Look, I don't know if he went to some elder. Maybe he did James chapter 5. Maybe he did that process, right? Once didn't quite work. Twice he tried again. Three times, hey, it's not working. He says, well, I guess God just wants to keep her there. There's a reason. Oh, it's because I'm full of pride. You know, and this is keeping me humble. He says, well, you know, if this is doing that job, this is a positive thing. I'm just going to glory in my infirmity. Thank you, God, for giving me this sickness because it keeps me from being a wicked man. It keeps me from being prideful. You know, it keeps me close to you. But brethren, how do you know that's you if you've not taken the approach of James chapter 5, right? I mean, wouldn't we need to do that first, okay? And if the sickness goes, praise God. But if it remains, then we can start formulating the idea, well, maybe this is something God wants to keep in me for His purposes, whatever that purpose is. Can you please go to Luke 17? We're almost done. Go to Luke 17. We're going to the last passage here. Luke 17. You know, brethren, all I'm saying to you is it works. I've only done it twice. It's not like I'm the kind of pastor, if you've got a, a cold or a flu, that I'm just going to go, let's do James chapter 5. No, look, if you want me to, I'll do it. Like, you know, it's, it's you calling the pastor. But you know what? If something is a, a regular 24-hour, 48-hour bug or something, you know, I probably wouldn't worry about that. But we can see some chronic issues that are there, some serious health issues. You know, that's what James chapter 5, I believe, is for, you know. I believe that's how we can apply that idea of the gift of healings that we see in chronic, uh, Corinthians today in our church, okay? Luke 17, verse 11. Let's read one more story here. It says here, And it came to pass, as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee, and as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Did they do the right thing? Yeah, they went to Jesus, okay? You know, when's the last time that you've been sick that you've gone to God and asked Him, you know? They sought out Jesus. They went looking for Him. Where's the body of Christ today? The church. Bring your prayer requests, your sicknesses to the body of Christ, brethren. This is where we can pray for these things, okay? The lepers went to seek Christ. Verse number 13. Uh, sorry, verse number 14. And when He saw them, He said unto them, Go show, your, go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. Hey, they obeyed Jesus. They're on the way to see the priests and they're cleansed from their leprosy. Praise God. Verse number 15. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, Were, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. Hey, what is it that gives us healings, even among sicknesses? Our faith. Our faith on Jesus. Okay? Their faith on Jesus made them whole. All ten of them got healed. Praise God. What a miracle. But only one came back to thank him. 
Only one came back to Jesus to say, thank you, what an amazing miracle. You know, you've delivered me. And brethren, my conclusion to you is this. You know, whatever sickness you have, whether it's the, it's the common cold, whether it's the coronavirus, <laughs> whether it's some chronic issue, whether it's a major problem, whatever it is, you know, and you find that God steps in and heals you, you go back to Jesus and say, thank you. Don't be like the other nine that just go about their business. I got healed, well, who cares? We don't have to say thank you to Jesus. You go back and you give God thanks for stepping in, for answering your prayer. How many of us have been sick over the last, since we started this church and we've gotten better? Hey, we had the whooping cough at the beginning. How many of you have it today? It's gone. We prayed about that seriously. How many of us did went back to Jesus and say thank you though? How many times have we said thank you every time we've been recovered from some sickness that we've gone to Jesus? So, you know, my conclusion to you, brethren, is this. I'm only here for a few more weeks, okay? And if you want to do this, let's do it. It's in the Bible. I'm not making this up. Okay, this is not some charismatic, stupid teaching. This is biblical truth. We do this, you may be healed. You may be healed. In fact, you should, we should take the attitude that you will be healed. Okay? Let's say you don't. But let's be like Paul. Let's try it two times, three times. If it doesn't go away, well, let's just say, well, Lord, there's a reason for this. You've left this for a reason. Help me understand what that reason is. And just glory in the affirmity that God has given you. Let's pray.